Our clothing, like a mirror, reflects the history of civilization. Today, it is more than just a shell. Fashion and style have become a new way of self-expression. To see deep symbolism in material things and speak with their clothing, personal belongings, and rituals. That is what Kazakhs are famous for. This is why history of a national costume is a whole new astonishing world, revealing the very essence of our mentality. Today, a great variety of clothing is available at the shops. Ready-to-wear dresses and suits simplify our lives and choices of clothing. However, there are always people who prefer a tailor-made garment or designer clothing. So, how our clothes are made and how they were made before. Today, we're going to talk about the methods of garments production. There are two types of garments production, mass and individual. The first type is basically the clothing that is produced in factories and by fashion houses. These are large-scale production garments and they come in standard sizes. Individual or tailor-made clothing is sewn especially for the wearer's body in sewing shops. These garments are usually made especially for the customer. Wealthy or famous people are the usual wearers of bespoke clothing. Possessing the only garment, one can always expect to be the center of attention. The public still remembers a fashion scandal that happened in 1961. Two stars, Elizabeth Taylor and Gina Lolo Brigida, wore identical dresses at an international film festival in Moscow. However, they decided to take advantage of the situation and stuck to each other for the rest of the evening. The process itself is very interesting. The production of garments, it is a global process. Lots of people are involved into it. Every single person is in charge of a certain thing. However, they all are working together to create one garment that later will be bought by a customer. There are certain differences between garments production in the fashion industry. There are haute couture and alta moda clothing categories. These clothes are considered as art they are known as high fashion, made to measure and bespoke, are other versions of individual tailoring, and these mainly have to do with male suits. However, haute couture clothes are sewn in accordance with already existing patterns, whereas patterns for made to measure garments are created from the scratch. A couple of years ago, high fashion has undergone through a revolution or rebellion. Domenico Dolce and Stefano Gabbana have staged their runway show in Sicily. They have violated the main rule of haute couture to stage all fashion shows in France only. As a result, the alternative of high fashion was born, so-called alta moda. It has spread across several countries, Italy, China, Japan, and Greece. In these countries, local designers have created unique garments based on their national and cultural traditions. This entire haute couture market is very interesting and worthy of close attention. If a designer or a fashion house wants to acquire an haute couture prefix before their names, they are supposed to do certain things. First and foremost, they need to apply to the trade association of high fashion in Paris, proving that they are ready to become haute couture brand. To accomplish this, designers are supposed to do the following. Their atelier must be based in Paris, and they are supposed to have at least 20 people of personnel. Another requirement, the most peculiar, in my opinion, is that the company has to have at least two to three models in their staff. It is a must. All garments are supposed to be 70% handmade, meaning that 70% of a garment should be hand-sewn from special fabrics. For what purposes does a customer need new clothes? This is the first and the most important question for any fashion designer. After he listens out to the customer's demands, he can start sketching a garment to be. As soon as customer agrees upon a sketch, accessories and fabric, we will start sewing his garment. 
It all starts with creating a stencil from a cheap fabric that has a similar construction to the main one. Ideally, two fittings with a client are needed to ensure that the clothing will fit like a glove. Then after the stencil perfectly fits the wearer's body, we start sewing an original garment using the fabric that was chosen by our customer. One more fitting follows to brush up small things, a button, a seam, and so on. After that, we finish the garment. Prada Porta trend has appeared in 1950s. As Miuccia Prada, a famous Italian designer, has said, Prada Porta is a clothing that moves from runways to new collections, to shops' counters. Fashion houses exist because of their mass production of ready-to-wear garments. In Kazakhstan, many fashion designers turn to the ateliers that can fulfill their clothing mass production orders of different level of complexity. Orders can vary in quantity from 50 to 10,000 pieces of garments. One of the most popular brands is Kameta, owned by Leila Abdul Kadyrova. As soon as designer has prepared the sketches of the collection, there is a next stage, purchasing of fabrics and accessories. Then, together with the fashion designer, the pattern, designer develops stencils and patterns. Ideally, based on these patterns, the first sample garment is sewn. Harsh climate, cattle breeding, and nomadic lifestyle. These were the things that dictated the appearance of every single element of nomadic costume. In modern language, a step man was his own designer and stylist. They had to survive. That's why they were sewing the clothes that were comfortable. Urban residents didn't need clothes like that. They had to be warm in winters, cool in summers, comfortable and light. And the nomads tried to make that happen. Take for instance leather boots with baypack linen. Stockings were knee-length, made of felt. They were really comfortable and warm. The leather is a breathable material. The wearer doesn't sweat in it. He isn't cold either. His knees are covered because the first thing that feels cold when you ride a horse are the knees. It might seem that haute couture has nothing to do with archaeology. However, it is archaeological findings that inspire fashion historians, designers, and show business stars. Not so long ago, singer Rihanna appeared on the cover of the Vogue Arabia, dressed like the Egyptian queen, Nefertiti. In 2013, Russian designer Valentin Yudashkin opened Moscow Fashion Week with his Scythian Gold collection. It is possible that a new surge of interest to nomads, costumes might follow, as a very important scientific discovery was made in the east of Kazakhstan. The finding was called the Ujar Princess. She lived in the 4th to 3rd centuries BC. Local restorers performed a miracle. They managed to recreate the image of this nomadic female who, as it turns out, possessed an extremely exquisite taste. In Ujar, there was textile and the silk, red and blue, Chinese silk. There was also a linen dress and some leather. Her hair was found too, and a lot of seeds. She had a fern in her hand, the one that grows in our land, and a stone altar. There were also many belongings that were preserved, gold jewelry, for instance. She was wearing an interesting headwear, and she had a golden crown. Not a single fashion house possesses this concentration of unique costume elements, items, and materials as Krim Altenbiekov's laboratory. Here is a fragment of the saddle, which, as I told you, is made of felt. Here you can see the textile, and here the embroidery. Of course, most of the threads have rotted, 
and only needle marks are seen now. Here we can see battles of different animal species. Here we can see the cat world and the antelope. Here is also an image of a beast, some fantastic winged animal. Then we see the embroidery. At some places it is still intact, at some it is not. And here is a red applique work. Here we see a fragment of a fantastic horse. Here you can see red textiles and this woolen textile. The most unique thing about Nomad's clothing production was the fact that certain magic and ritual meanings were attributed to the garments. The fabric was covered with symbols and signs that were supposed to protect the wearer. It was a usual technology. Two pieces of fabrics were sewn together. Sleeves were attached to it. Another two pieces of fabrics. All of these were square and rectangular in shape to make clothing more comfortable. Over time, individual details were added. It was necessary to decorate the dress with an ornament, especially the hems. These places were considered as vulnerable. Collar, sleeves, edges, and edges of the hem. These places were covered with ornaments in order to protect the wearer. People thought that clothing was kind of a shelter for a body, so they would cover it to protect it from many different things. Back then, people were afraid of the evil eye. They were afraid of. It was believed that there was something, like a devil, that could harm the person. The seams would be embroidered with ornaments, too, as the seams were believed to be vulnerable places. The ways the costumes were made depended on what Nomad was doing for living, what he was breeding or hunting. Usually, skins of foals, lambs, or goats were used to make clothes. There were a number of secrets of leather dressing. The suede was used to make japans, furs, belts, and footwear. Camel wool was used to make cloaks, shiikpian. It was an essential garment for any shepherd or traveler. Women used to process felt, from which headwear kalpak and different handbags and footwear were made. Men's hunting replenished wardrobe with the clothes made of skin of onagers, foxes, wolves, stoats, and ferrets. Speaking of female clothing, there were chapans. They were made of different kind, autumn, spring, summer chapans, chapans worn by people of different social status. If the woman was a representative of a high class, Han's wife, B's wife, or if she was a daughter of noble parents, she would wear a chapan made from expensive fabrics and fur. Lambskin or camel wool. If her social status was even higher, skin of a one-year or a two-year animal was used to make her chapan. Because the younger the animal, the softer the fur is, the fur from the back of the neck was usually used in chapan making. Wealthy people's clothing was different. It was embellished. A collar or sleeves were made of fur animal skin. The commoners would wear clothes made from a regular leather or regular fur. The Great Silk Road, on which cities like Otra and Siganak were situated, has significantly contributed to the development of crafts in the area. Local craftswomen introduced all new fabrics and materials that were coming to the steppes with the caravans into their works, and very often, nomadic women managed to get hold of the latest fashions even before the European women did. Hence the talents for combining patches, shells, gems, and beads. There was a settlement called Jatak, where metals were mined and people were engaging in crafts and metals forging. These blacksmiths, craftsmen, seamstresses, shoemakers, and so on, all those people who worked there. They were making clothes that later ended up in the Mediterranean civilizations, garments like boots or pants, for instance. A garment that was the most difficult to make was the cone-shaped female headwear. 
Sao Kilea. As marketing experts would say today, it was the most important investment. The frame was lined with fabric, the top of the headwear was embellished with various plates and gems, a silk or velvet veil was attached to the back side of the Sao Kilea, and pendants, Jacques Tao, were hanging from the sides. Simple saukileas were trimmed with broadcloth or satin, and instead of precious stones, glass beads were used. Saukileas were different too. What were the differences? The height of saukilea was a way of indicating your social status. Saukilea was embellished with fur, gems, and a silver pendant, and length of the pendant varied too. Sometimes the pendants could be waist long. There is a historical manuscript where Saukilea is described. A daughter of one of the Hans of the Lesser Jews was getting married to a Han of the Middle Jews. Her father sent his future son-in-law a Saukilea and said, value your future bride Saukilea, and you can equate it with the bride money. Kienisari's Han's elder brother said that Saukilea was worth 500 horses, and that is equal to 500 horses. Today, clothing production obeys the rules of trends, styles, popular colors, prints, and cuts. Fast fashion never ceases to produce new collections. However, the fashion is cyclical, and all the trends have already been invented long ago. Bearing this in mind, it is even more fascinating to imagine how our ancestors were inspired by the nature, its elements, stellar sky, and the mysterious underworld. This is how the costume and animal style jewelry featuring cosmogonic symbols, zoomorphic and flora ornaments were made. The clothes were different. They were decorated with ornaments, silver and gold plates. There were even elements like belts and buttons that were decorated with inlay. The clothes were sacred, and for a nomad, it was not necessary to ask the guest where he was coming from or who he was, because the clothes were the best indicator of what land the guest was coming from, what region, clan, or juice. And of course, just by looking at the clothes, one could immediately understand person's social status. The ornaments were of different kinds, zoomorphic, floral, geometrical. This was only natural, as a nomad who lived in the steppe was close to the nature. The nature was his main source of everything. Gazing at the sky, he would think of certain elements like the sun, for instance, or the moon. The nomad had a great consideration of the flora, too, as it was a source of food, health, and cattle feed. And the cattle were considered as a source of life. That's why nomadic clothes were embellished with floral ornaments, petals, oval ornaments. As for geometry, it was something that the Kazakhs were fascinated by. They used geometrical ornaments very carefully. And, of course, the animal style. Any ornaments featured horns, hooves, teeth, and fangs. Because all of these elements were considered as nomadic amulets. In the old days, every step girl learned how to sew. Sometimes it would facilitate her relationship with a guy. A needlewoman would embroider a small handkerchief with ornaments that were supposed to express her feelings, and then she would give this handkerchief to her beloved. This was called a kestili or a mal. The kerchief symbolized purity and loyalty. Every year, Pantone Color Institute announces the main color of the year and presents the palette of different shades to designers, florists, and other consumer-oriented companies. In the old days, however, every color had a sacred meaning behind it. The Kazakhs used various plants and minerals to dye fabrics.
The priestesses used to wear red. It was the color of fire, warm, the color of power. Yellow was considered as the color of sun. The royalty used to wear red clothes. The jewelry was yellow. White was the color of tin. It was worn by the commoners. And the silver, of course. The most common colors in the Pazuri culture were red, blue, yellow, and white tin. From the 1950s, synthetics were introduced in the production of ready-to-wear clothes. Since then, the chemical industry has been inventing lots of new materials and fabrics. However, if there was a choice and if the price is affordable, the customer will always opt for the things that were invented by our ancestors. In the 18th century, a Swedish traveler, Johan Falk, wrote, Silk, velvet, and other expensive fabrics are used in the making of clothes of noble Kyrgyz, Kazakh, women more often that in the making of men's clothing. Commoners wear a cloth that covers their head like a cap, leaving a long train hanging from their backs. They embellish it with fringe, laces, and pendants. Every single thing that was used before is used now. Only the quality has changed. It has become better, more modern, and more high-tech. The most favorite fabrics that was loved by our steppe ancestors was velvet. There were also woven fabrics, cotton and silk. All of these is still used. As for the outerwear, they used to wear cloaks. Also, in ancient times, they wore suede, but today, suede is less common. But I believe it will catch up with the fashion soon and take its niche. For now, velvet is used more and is very common in the collections of our famous Kazakh designers. I like to use it too. Thousands and thousands of years have passed from the moment a man has first invented clothing. In the mid of 19th century, mass production of clothing has replaced handicraft garments in France. In the 21st century, this process is evolving as the new technologies and methods of garments production emerge. After the collapse of the USSR, the process of garments production in Kazakhstan was developing slowly and gruelingly. Everything had to be made from the scratch. At the beginning, there was a total deficit of everything. There was no good clothes whatsoever. At the time, we had to use fabrics we could find in our grandmother's chest. We used these fabrics to sew something suitable to wear for occasion. That was what we did. It was so cool at the time. After this total deficit, they started to import many different things. And so many new things appeared. Different kinds of fabrics, different pieces, different styles. And our customers were longing for something unique, something personal. And here is where our young designers came forward. They began to offer all kinds of interesting trends and colors that they use in the making of their collections. And it wasn't just about colors, but also about the quality of fabrics. They combined incompatible. And these were very interesting models. Today, designers are free to create anything they like. New domestic brands emerge, mass and bespoke tailoring are developing. And often, all of this is based on the garments production traditions that we are very proud of. Just imagine the amount of fantasy, efforts and productive resources that are used in garments production. The costume of our ancestors has undergone the same exciting process. As it turns out, all of it didn't sink into oblivion. Some ideas and methods that old masters were using are still relevant today. But whatever you opt for, whether it is shopping for a perfect dress or waiting until it will be tailor-made, we wish you to look stylish and irresistible.